10th April 2022, the eyes are useless when the mind is blinded by Pastor Simon. The eyes are useless when the mind is blind. Greetings in the name of Jesus and well, welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. I am Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you. We trust you'll find this message inspiring and uplifting. May you be receptive to the voice of the blessed Holy Spirit. Riverside Tabernacle is an online Christian ministry committed to preaching the truth about Jesus Christ and His redemptive work. To view other videos like this, visit our YouTube channel, Riverside Tabernacle SA, or Facebook page, Riverside Tabernacle. Riverside Tabernacle does not own the rights to the music or the pictures used in this video. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus this morning, and we thank you, Lord, on this Palm Sunday that we remember... Lord, the time that when you rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. We thank you, O Lord, for the record of that that we read in your word. And tonight, this morning, Lord, as we delve into your word, we believe, O Lord, that the Holy Spirit will speak to us. And we open our minds to the Holy Spirit. We open our minds so that we can hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. That we can hear the voice of God speaking in our inner spiritual ear. Holy Spirit, Speak to us this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Our scripture reading is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 42 to 44. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, if you even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And they will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Praise God. The king weeps. As Jesus rode closer to Jerusalem, he raised his voice and wept out aloud, weeping, hardly the be expected behavior of a king. But this was no ordinary king. This was Jesus the Christ, the king of all kings, a king who loved his people. So why was he weeping? I'm taking you back today to Palm Sunday. I'm taking you back to that Sunday, a week before the Lord rose from the dead. The week on that Sunday when he rode down to Jerusalem on the colt, the foal of an ass, a foal of a donkey, when his dis disciples and others threw palm branches in front of him, when they threw the clothes in front of him, so that he, he rode over them into Jerusalem. It's known as the triumphal entry, triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. But during this triumphal entry, there was something that's of vital importance. Vital importance because the king, Jesus, weeps aloud. There is another portion we hear also in, in, in John 11.35 where Jesus weeps. It, it goes, simply says that verse, Jesus wept at the death of Lazarus when he had compassion on Lazarus and his sisters. But here Jesus weeps and we're going to find out now why he wept. This itinerant preacher from Galilee was not the son of of Joseph and Mary. He was the son of the living God. He was God in human form. He wept because the very people he came to save did not recognize who he really was. For all the clues he gave them, they still did not see who he was. Israel prayed for peace. They had been praying for peace for 400 years. They longed for peace and for an end to the tyranny of the Roman Empire under which they lived. Yet when the Prince of Peace rode into town, they rejected him as a delusional Nazarene. The Pharisees asked him 
to rebuke his disciples because his disciples, for some of them, were calling him king. That while he was riding on the donkey over the palm leaves and over the clothing of the people who were worshipping him and shouting, Hosanna to the king. The Pharisees were watching. And the Pharisees who were in charge of the temple, the Sanhedrin, they were in charge of the religious aspects of the Jewish of Jewish life. They told him, rebuke your disciples for calling you a king. And Jesus said to them, if I, if I rebuke them, the stones will cry out. And Jesus wept for the pain and suffering of his people. The pain and suffering that they would suffer for rejecting him as their king. If you reject Jesus, you will suffer for it. He came to save them from the enemies, chief of which is Satan. Yet they spurned his love in favor of their own traditional brand of worship. They worshiped money and fame instead of their true king. Just a second. Just one second, I've just got a little technical problem. They worshipped money and fame instead of the true king. This was the brand of worship that the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and the chief priest and, and his and fellow priests had instilled into the Jewish people a brand of worship that was traditional. And Jesus wept because he saw the destruction of the temple that would follow. And it happened in AD 70. And the killing of children by the Romans where children were dashed, to, dashed against the rocks to kill them. He wept because he came to his own and his own received him not, John uh, chapter 1. Instead, they sought to kill the very one who exchanged his heavenly throne for a Roman cross on Golgotha. He wept because those who had charge over his house chose to reject him. When Jesus left, uh, sorry, when Jesus uh, was on earth and before Jesus came, the Lord left the priests in charge of the temple. The priests were in charge of worship. And what did they do? They chose to reject him. He wept because countless millions would reject him through the ages, even though he was going to die for them. He wept because he knew that some of you, some of us would reject him. And all the while the stones that he rode on the rocks on the side of the road were aching to cry out, Hail Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hail Son of God. Hail God incarnate. Yes, the stones cry out. On the Higginson Highway in Chatsworth, Durban in South Africa, near an, near an overhead bridge, is a large rock with a sign painted on it. Over the more than 30 years that it has been there that I know of, the rock has spoken to millions that pass by that way. I am not sure if anyone knows who exactly went up there onto that rock and painted the words, but it says simply, Jesus saves. And that rock has cried out. It may not have a voice like I have this morning, but that voice has held that painted sign on it for years and years, for decades it's been there. And every second of every day, 24-7, it is shouting out, Jesus saves. And whenever I see that rock, I remember what the Lord's words were in this passage. I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And I think to myself, was Jesus talking about this rock? Yes, he was. And very much, very many more. There are walls, bridges, bumper stickers, signs and billboards throughout the world screaming out the message of Jesus. And they never cease to, to scream out the message that Jesus saves. 
that Jesus is the Savior. Recently, a church organization put up a huge sign on the M4 in our city. It depicts the crucifixion and reads, Live for me, I died for you. What a beautiful message at this Passover time, at this Easter time. A timeless reminder of what Jesus did for us. Imagine that a king sacrificed himself for his subjects. What is painful is, is realizing that those very subjects do not appreciate his sacrifice. And when he came to them, they rejected him. Jesus, you know, many people claim that Jesus didn't say that, well, many people say that Jesus didn't claim that he was God. But if you go back to uh, the 41st, uh, 45th, uh, 44th uh, verse of Luke 19, it says very, very explicitly, these are the words of Jesus. He says, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. He was telling those Pharisees and they knew it. He was saying to you, this is the time that I'm coming to you. I am God. The Pharisees knew it. They knew the scriptures. So they knew what Jesus was saying. Which God beside the God of the Bible left his throne and came to live with the poorest of the poor? Which God beside Jesus of the Bible loved his subjects enough to die for them? In most battles, the king is protected at all costs, even in the, even in the game of chess. You can even sacrifice the queen, but the king must be kept because when the king is killed, the kingdom is destroyed. Soldiers ensure in normal battles that the king does not participate in the actual fighting but directs the battle from relative safety. The soldiers are trained and expected to give their lives for their king. In the great, in the great battle of souls of mankind, King Jesus didn't sit in a safe place. He went to the front line and gave his life so that we might live, so that you might live and that I might live. Rather than allow us to fight in the battle for our souls, he took our place. But sadly, most refused to see the sacrifice he made. They refused to recognize that he was God in flesh. Their minds are closed off. Their minds are blind. Their minds are blinded to the message and truth of Jesus, their Savior. Blinded minds. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, it was not the simple folk that rejected him. It was the educated Pharisees, Sadducees and rabbis, the chief priests and the priests, the Sanhedrin, the council of elders, the big wigs, the clergy, the pastors, the reverends, the right reverend, you know, those guys who like to be addressed with titles. They were the guys that rejected Jesus. The simple minded folk accepted Jesus for who he was. They accepted him. They didn't know everything, but they knew he was from God because they said no one can do miracles except God. They knew that he could give life. They'd seen it. They knew that he could raise the dead. They knew that he could heal the, the, the deaf. He could heal the blind. He could heal the, the, the mute. They knew that. They'd seen it. They knew that when he touched people, people who were, who were crippled woke up and ran. He, they knew that the incurable disease of leprosy could be cured by the word from this man. They thought he was a prophet. The educated Pharisees, Sadducees, rabbis, etc. They rejected him. You see, it wasn't the simple minded folk who read the scriptures. Most of them probably couldn't read. It was the educated ones who read and the simple folk had the scriptures read to them in the synagogue. So when the high and mighty priest stood up or the chief priest stood up, who was even higher and mightier. And they took out a scroll of Isaiah and they read the people, the men sitting there or standing in the synagogue. Listened to every word and they tried to memorize it. 
And if these guys then interpreted the message wrongly, these people received the wrong message. They didn't go back and check it because they didn't have the scriptures. So they were dependent on these leaders. Now it was not the simple minded folk who started the riot which ended in Jesus' crucifixion. It was the religious leaders. The very ones that Jesus had placed in charge as God. He placed these people in charge of his temple. One of them was the one that was chosen as a chief priest. And every year, once a year, he would go into the most holiest place. He would stand between the outer curtain and the inner curtain. And he would intercede on behalf of the people. And yet this man rejected the Lord. He rejected the God that he was claiming to serve. You see, the so-called thinkers were the ones who led the common people astray with the interpretation, twisted interpretation of the scriptures. They knew exactly who Jesus was claiming to be when he used the word I am. And when he said, who can forgive sinners except God? He, when he said, who is, who is good except God? When they called him good, he said, who, can, who is good except God? They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. You see, it wasn't Jesus' time to go to the cross. So he spoke in innuendo. He spoke in riddles. But these people knew exactly. That is why they charged him with blasphemy. Because they knew that he claimed to be God. That's the testimony of a hostile witness. They knew from scripture that Jesus was claiming to be God. And I believe that they knew who he was, he claimed to be. They knew exactly that he was who he claimed to be. They recognized him as God. They saw him. They knew this was God, but they would not admit it. If they had studied the scriptures diligently and they were experts of the law as they were, it would have been obvious to them that Jesus was really God. It would have jumped out at them because he fulfilled every prophecy of the coming Messiah. Yeshua, Mashiach, every one of the prophecies. Zechariah, Daniel, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, everyone, Ezekiel, everyone who spoke about him said things and these things came to pass in Jesus' life. They could see it was him. Yet they closed their minds to the truth. They blinded their minds. And the eyes are useless when the mind is blind. They are none so blind as those who will not see. That's taken from the book of Jeremiah. I think it's chapter 25. They are none so blind as those who will not see. It's not in the same words, but this is paraphrased from there. As can, as can be seen from the anger of Jesus against the use or their use of the temple as a marketplace, Jesus was not the king they desired. You'll find in the next paragraph, Jesus goes the next morning, as, uh, as I think uh, uh, Mark says, Jesus looked at how they were making the temple a marketplace. And the next day he went there, he made a cord of whips, and he drove out all the animals, he overturned the tables and shouted the people out. He chased them out. Jesus didn't make the whip to whip the people. Some people think Jesus will use violence. No, he used that to drive out the animals. The people, he chased them out. And he did overturn the tables in zeal. of The zeal for, his, for the house of God consumed him. Jesus was not the king they desired. They expected a king to come in and say, boys, you're doing very well. Keep it up. Let's build a bigger temple. Let's build a flea market here. Let's do this every day. Let's ask for a bigger tithe. You see, whatever their reason, they didn't want Jesus. Jesus was messing up their works. Jesus was a fly in the ointment. He was a spanner in the works. They desired a king who would martially liberate them from Roman rule. Go to war against the Romans. And more importantly, they wanted a king. They wanted a Messiah who would turn a blind eye to the materially minded, materially oriented, money grabbing religion. And we still have those people with us. We still have them. 
Yeah, many of us, people like me in suits and ties, who are really money grabbers. They serve mammon, not God, not Jesus. The religious leaders of the time relished their power over the people, a power that was underpinned by Roman rule and Jewish tradition. They used the Jewish tradition to enslave the people. They used the law to enslave the people. They used the law, the law of God, the law of Moses, as we know, the Mosaic law. They used it to enslave the people into, into their own traditions. You see, they used, they had certain leeway to judge and they judged according to their minds rather than listening to God. They didn't judge according to the word of God. And the people accepted their judgment because after all, they were God's uh, oracles on earth. And they had a deal with the Roman governors. The Roman governors took care of them. Corruption was rife at that time. The Roman governors took care of them. They left them alone. They allowed them to govern themselves religiously. So they had power. They had power. The only thing they couldn't do was crucify Jesus. That is why they went to Pilate and forced him to crucify Jesus. The only penalty they could execute, was, death penalty, was by stoning. But they, they wanted Jesus crucified, which again was prophetically spoken about. Now, over the years, the leaders had exchanged the doctrines of God for the doctrines of man. And then Jesus came in. This Jesus, this upstart itinerant preacher from Galilee. That's what they saw him as. This delusional Jew. Young men coming here and telling the, the teachers what they need to do. At the age of 12, he had them confounded with these questions. He threatened the status quo. He threatened the status quo. He threatened their very existence. They knew that, wow, if this man gets out of hand, if his following gets too big, we doomed. Now, not willing to relinquish their hold on power, the religious leaders refused to admit that Jesus was God. They refused. Not that they didn't know. They definitely knew. They knew. Any fool who had read the scripture at that time would know that Jesus was God. They knew he was God. Everything that was said, they knew, but they refused to admit. They blinded their minds. By blinding their minds, their eyes saw what they wanted them to see. They decided that he was too much of a threat for their power to their power to live. But how did they kill him? They couldn't find a reason to kill him. So they devised a plan that would involve blinding the minds of the simple folk who followed Jesus. The eyes are useless when the mind is blind. They use the word of God against the word of God himself. Did you get that? They use the word of God, the scripture, against the word of God who is Jesus himself. The technique they use is the same technique that was used by their father, the devil, in his futile attempt to tempt Jesus. Yes, they use the scripture, calling Jesus a blasphemer. To the simple Jew, a charge of blasphemy was the utmost sin that one could, uh, that one could carry out. Twisted use of the scripture blinded the minds of Blinded the minds of the masses to the goodness of Jesus. That's how clever these people were. They were blinding. They, they bl deliberately blinded their minds. And then they tried to blind the minds of the people. Their blinded minds chose to forget the good that the Lord had done and focus on his alleged sin of blasphemy only. You see, by blinding the minds of the people, they got them to see what they wanted them to see. Now, someone said, madness among individuals is rare, but in a crowd, it is the rule. So many who hailed Jesus as king a few days before, many of those who are hailing Jesus now as you picture Jesus uh, uh, riding down on a donkey, Many of those people 
were in the crowd that called for his crucifixion. A lot of those people that called him king one week, or earlier in the week, later called him an imposter. Such is the power of the learned over the simple. That is why many governments, especially communist governments, dumb their people. They attack education. They keep education simple and mundane, simple and elementary. As long as a person can read a bit and write a bit and he can speak, that's fine. Because then you can tell them anything and they believe it because they don't know better. They dumb the mind. They, they take away the innate uh, or the inherent uh, uh, quest to seek knowledge. But just to believe whatever you're told. Now there were those who still trusted and loved Jesus in the crowd as well. But their voices were silenced in the crowd. I said to you, madness among individuals, individuals is rare in a crowd, it is a rule. So even when a crowd is shouting, you can become the lone voice that's shouting against them and you are drowned. It's like trying to shout against the loud peals of thunder. Even Hitler had dissenters. When Hitler was making his speech, his speeches, when he was calling for invasion of Poland and other places, Latvia and all these places, he had dissenters. When he was calling for the Aryan race and, and, and preaching superiority of the Aryan race in apartheid, then he had dissenters, but they did not matter. They were few, too few to make a difference. And even nowadays you find with the false prophet situation, there are still good ministers out there. There are still men who are preaching the unadulterated word of God, but their voices are few and far between. Wrong leadership leads to wrong beliefs. Our contemporary churches are plagued with such false teachers. Sorry, I have to say this, but I have to say it. Well, I'm not sorry. I need to say it. They are not a new phenomenon. They were there at that time. The chief priest and the Sanhedrin were false teachers too. And like all false teachers, they use the scripture to support their own self-serving doctrines. You see, the eyes are useless when the mind is blinded. Be careful of studying the scriptures without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Be careful of ex accepting whatever is written or spoken without checking its accuracy against the Bible. People, Christian people, are churning out books by the dozens every week. Every week there's a new book or two or maybe a dozen coming out. Most of these books don't even, are not even based on the Word of God. Many of these books don't even have the name of Jesus in it, yet they are written by men who call themselves reverend and pastor and doctor of theology. Theologians. How can you be a theologian writing a book about God and not refer to his word. Be careful of accepting what is written or spoken. We tend to believe everything that comes across social media. We tend to believe everything that is spoken by some guy on a mic. There's lots of conspiracies. We believe everything because we see it. We see it in black and white. We believe it. If it's written down, we believe it. It might be false, but we believe it because it's written down. Be careful. Check its accuracy. Check its authenticity against the Bible. False teachers rely on ignorance for their success. The false teacher relies on our ignorance for his success. My illustration today is the king who loved his people. A king was away at a conference in a faraway country. While his king, while his while he was away, his kingdom was taken over by a political enemy in a coup. The enemy ruled in his place and the rightful king was exiled. While the king was away, his cabinet, who he left in charge, realigned themselves with the enemy. Their friendship with the enemy was based on mutual benefit. The new king, the enemy king, treated them well and they all became very rich. But he was cruel to the general populace. Another symptom of uh, corruption. 
And in return, these people who were loyal to the first king used their influence over the people by promoting, uh, sorry, to promote the enemy as a good king, which was certainly not the case. The original king returned in disguise. He decided to come back and meet his people and see what's going on because he had a concern for them. He came back in a disguise. He looked very different from what he was and he was not recognizable. He went around visiting his people and soon he had a following. But although no one recognized him, he soon had many followers and many of them were saying, we wish you could be our king. You're so much like our original king. But his old advisors, the cabinet that he left in charge, who, who betrayed him. They thought he was very familiar too. And from his speech, when they followed him around, they eventually, from what he said, you know, everybody has a pattern of speech. And when they followed him around, listening to him from the fringes of the crowds, they eventually recognized who he was. They realized that he was the king. They realized that even though he had now had a beard, he looked very different. He dressed shabbily. There was no ring on his finger, no crown on his head. His hair was long. He was unkempt. They realized that he was the king and that made them very nervous. Because they felt that he might be getting ready to take back his throne. And it made them nervous because if he returned to power, they would end up in prison for corruption or worse. They could be executed for treason. So they got together and they plotted to kill him. They told lies about him and eventually, slowly, eventually turned the majority against the old king. They slowly went to, they went to people and kept saying things about him. They got rogue, uh, rogues to be witnesses and say he said this and he said that. And eventually the people started to trust them. You see the people trusted them because when the old king went away, who was in exile, these people looked to their leaders, but their leaders betrayed them. And now the leaders betray them even further by speaking lies about this king. And they believed them and they began to trust the visitor. Then the advisors went to the new king and they accused the visitor of treason. That king who believed them, he obviously believed them because they were his friends. He arrested this king. They tried him and they imprisoned him all on false witness. While in prison, the king was very disappointed because all he ever wanted to do was liberate his people from the cruel tyrant who, who ruled them. He was also sad that his old advisors, who knew exactly who he was, did not support him. They betrayed him. His only fault was that he loved his country and his people and he wanted to save them. It's the same with the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, the Bible says, he came to his own and his own received him not. He left his gilded palace in heaven. He left his throne up in heaven. He took on the form of flesh. He came and for 33 years he lived as a baby. For th uh, sorry, 30, uh, he came as a baby. And for 30 years he lived as a child, an adult, uh, an, uh, a teenager, an adolescent, and an adult. And at the age of 30 he went out preaching. The kingdom of God is at hand. All Jesus was, wanted was to save you. Jesus didn't want your money. He still doesn't. Jesus didn't want you to do any rituals. He, he still doesn't. Jesus didn't want you to sell everything and come and join him. He still doesn't. Jesus wants to save you. Jesus is not interested in your money. He's interested in you. He's interested in you. He's interested in your health. He's interested in your life. He's interested in you being prosperous. But not in the sense that you must be rich. In the sense that you're adequately taken care of. He's interested in you being his brother, his child, his servant. Not his slave. He never called us to be slave. He called us to be workers. We're not slaves. The father loved us with the same love that he loved his son. And it is the only 
Godhead. It's only God. That had love long before he made us. Because the father loved the son. There was father, son and Holy Spirit. There is father, son and Holy Spirit. The three persons of the Godhead. And there is love between them. There is unity in the community of the Trinity. There is love. Amongst them. That is why I can say. From the bottom of, my, a bottom of my heart. That no other God can show love. Because they have not shown love. They do not have love. There's gods who want you to be slaves. There's gods who want you to keep working for your salvation. Yet Jesus says don't work for your salvation. I'm giving it to you freely. Just take it. How do you take it? By accepting Jesus as your savior. And this is what Jesus wept for that day. Because the eyes were, were useless. Because their minds were blind. The people who saw Jesus didn't see Jesus. They just saw a man who was claiming to be God. Or they saw, most of them, the, the poor crowd saw a man who they thought was a prophet. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rabbis, the chief priests, the priests, the Sanhedrin and other members of the clergy saw Jesus. They knew he was God. But they blinded their minds. Blinding their minds, blinded their eyes. They would not see. There are none so blind as those who would not see. Will not see. That is what I want you to know today. Keep your eyes open. The eyes are useless when the mind is blind. Millions follow false teachers and trusting the eternity in the hands of wolves in sheep's clothing. I need to mention this. A preacher that all of you know, Kenneth Copeland, you know him? Yes, all of you know him. He speaks as if he's the head of the Christian, the Protestant faith. This man is worth 700, so 760 million US dollars. He claims I'm a very wealthy man. He's got an airport on his ranch. He's got three jets. What does he need three multi-million dollar jets? Not rand, we're talking dollars, American dollars. What does he need that for? He needs it for the ministry, he says. When he bought his recent, recently he bought a, 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 a citation jet, I think it was. No one knows how much, probably around 12 million US dollars. He bought it from a, from a, a filmmaker. And when he was asked about it, he said, I'm a very wealthy man and I need this. And he said, if I don't have this, I won't be able to do 65% of my job. And yet he used the jet, he used his jets to travel 143 times to his holiday home. That's what he uses it for. He uses it to jet around the world. This man is a man whose wife claims that he can control the weather. He can stop a thunderstorm. He can stop a hurricane. Yet we've had Hurricane Katrina and many others come through. He's a man who claimed that he can stop COVID. And we still have COVID. Despite his screaming at COVID. Ranting and raving like a lunatic. Where did the money come from? For the jet. Where did the money come from? He needed another 17 million dollars to build a hangar for the jet and to provide maintenance support. And where do you think he gets it from? From the church. And fools like us give him our money. He's the same man who called normal people like us demons. He said he cannot get into, he was saying to his good friend and fellow false evangelist, Jesse Duplantis, another rogue. And you can tell them I said that. They are rogues. I will prove from the Bible they are rogues. He said to him, he said, Jesse, we can't get into commercial aircraft with, with normal people. It's like getting into a long tube filled with demons. Is that what he calls human beings? Demons? 
Jesse Duplantis is a man who says that God asks him for advice. God asks him for advice. Yes, my photographer is laughing. He, uh, my videographer is laughing. He says God asks him for advice. And these guys say that they feel so close to God when they're up there that God can speak to them because they believe that going up uh, 10 kilometers into the air is so much closer to God than us here. Now, I didn't know that God just sits there and doesn't talk to us down here. But all of them asking for money during the lockdown, when churches were closed, Kenneth Copeland had this to say. He said, don't you stop tithing. Even if it means you have to walk to the church and put your envelope under the door, don't you stop tithing. You can't come to church. Yes, I understand. But you must pay your tithe. You know why? Because he bankrolls his lavish lifestyle. These are the kind of false teachers that we have. And these are the kind of false teachers that stood on the road while Jesus walked, uh, 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 rode down as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And they refused to acknowledge him because he was going to... The true gospel of Jesus destroys the, the kingdoms of money. You understand what I'm saying? So search the scriptures yourself. You will learn more with the Holy Spirit than you can ever learn in the best Bible schools. I've been to Bible schools and they teach you a lot. But the most I've learned, the deepest truths I've learned is from listening to the Holy Spirit while I read the words of God himself. Be an independent thinker whose mind is not blinded, whose mind is not blinded by the false doctrines of self-serving charlatans or charlatans, sorry. Keep your eyes open and see the real Jesus, not the one that others want you to see. We trust you've enjoyed God's word. And that it has been a blessing to you. If you are inspired by it, please share it with your friends and family. Yes, I know some of the things I say are controversial. But I'm not here to please men. I'm here to speak the truth. And I will speak it until the day I die. Regardless of what men thinks of me. Remember, we live on Facebook every Wednesday at 7 p.m. And Sunday at 10 a.m. This is Pastor Simon. And as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless.